Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. The land down under has never been easier to reach. United Airlines has more flights between the U.S. and Australia than any other U.S. airline. So you can fly nonstop to destinations like Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. Explore dazzling cities, savor the very best of Aussie cuisine, and get up close and personal with the wildlife. Who doesn't want to hold a koala? Go to united.com slash Australia to book your adventure. You're listening to Well Now, Slate's podcast on health and wellness. I'm Maya Feller. And I'm Kavita Patel. Today we are talking about diets, more specifically vegan diets. A vegan diet is a type of plant-based diet that excludes all animal-derived foods and products. Most people know there are two basic rules to a vegan diet. No eating meat of any kind and no eating any products made by animals. So beyond the standard vegetarian diet, which excludes beef, pork, chicken, fish, etc., you can't eat any dairy products such as milk, cheese, and yogurt, or eggs and honey. Vegan diets consist entirely of plant-based foods, such as fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Just a few decades ago, it would have been hard to find many vegan-friendly food options at most grocery stores or even at a restaurant, let alone any studies that illustrate the link between a vegan diet and its health benefits. But today we have an overwhelming amount of evidence that there can be tangible benefits, including protective antioxidants and phytonutrients, which could lower the risk of certain types of cancers, aid in weight loss or help maintaining healthy weight, as well as maybe lowering blood sugar levels, which could be beneficial for both type 2 diabetics, type 1 diabetics, and even pre-diabetics. Most recently, the case for the benefits of a vegan diet or at the heart of the Netflix documentary series, You Are What You Eat. I've tested many diets over the years looking for the healthiest ones. A major challenge in nutrition studies is everyone is unique and responds differently to the same food. So what if we got people who are genetically the same? Just like us. <laughs> Twins share the same DNA, so we get to see if it's about your greens, not your genes. For the next day, the we, limited we'll series features a study of identical twins comparing vegan and omnivore diets, along with incorporating regular exercise. I remember talking about the series with some colleagues and seeing a ton of viewers on social media remark about how much of a difference a plant-based versus omnivore diet can affect the body. But Maya, you're the expert in the room. You're the dietitian. This isn't the whole story, or is it? Well, so here's the thing, Kavita, that I find so interesting about this. When we look at the body of research, we know that plants in any shape or form can be really beneficial to human health. The challenge is, is that most people, especially living in the United States of America, do not have plants at the center of their eating pattern, right? People tend to prioritize animal protein. So when they're building a meal, I don't know how you build a meal, Kavita, but like I know many of my patients, they'll say, oh, I'm going to have steak and. They rarely say, I'm going to have broccoli, black beans and. So plants are really not at the center. And what I think is so interesting is that when we're looking at vegan versus vegetarian versus omnivorous patterns of eating, the truth is plants in any form, when eaten in abundance, even if you're not a vegetarian and you eat animal proteins, that's where we see the gold happen. That's when we see all of those beneficial shifts with regard to health. So for me, I think you don't have to be a vegan. You don't have to be a vegetarian. If that's what you want to do, then by all means, go for it. What I do say is that we want to see a variety and abundance of plants on your plate on a regular and consistent basis with the mindful addition, and I say mindful, Kavita, of added sugars, fats, and salt. So that means that those things fall into that bucket of not being central to anybody's pattern of eating. 
So Kavita, you know, how do you think about integrating some of the research recommendations that we see around dietary patterns for your patients? Or is that something that you try to do? Um, honestly, I don't. I don't do a great job at this because frankly, I don't have enough time. Usually 15 minutes and the average person over the age of 40 has anywhere from two to six chronic conditions. So if you do the math, and I, I realize how dumb that sounds because probably the best thing I could do is spend time talking to people about diet and that could impact all those chronic conditions, as I mentioned. But I think that it's a combination of, we, we get about two weeks of training in nutrition across, I've had 12 years of medical education. <laughs> so you can imagine how much of an expert I feel in that. I usually do try to get them to people like you so that someone thoughtful who's studied this can actually spend time with patients. But I think that the hardest thing for most of my patients, and I'm just going to say myself, is sticking to it as well as paying for it. I know I can tell you my there were definite days during medical school residency fellowship and even after I graduated from fellowship and had like a job job there, you know, there were so many days where I too bought, if anybody knows and who's listening knows what Arby's is, I bought the Arby's five corned beef sandwiches for $4 special when they would run that because I thought this is great. I've got meals for five days on $4. And I don't think I'm that different. I think now I've graduated into a class of privilege. I can afford healthy foods. I've got kids I'm trying to buy healthy fruits and vegetables for at farmers markets at places like that. But the truth the majority of people, I think, were in the bucket I was in for a long time trying to figure out how to buy it. How has that come up in, in your professional and personal environment? Kavita, all the time. And I agree with you that, yeah, food is expensive. And especially when we're talking about plant-based foods, it can get even more expensive. One of the things that I like to remind people is when I said fruits and vegetables, so plants in any form, I do lean into frozen I lean into canned, I lean into freeze charred, I lean into box jarred. And what I say is this is where people have to be informed consumers. So remember those added sugars, fats, and salts? That's what we don't want to see at the center of the plate because that's really what's linked to those chronic conditions or the, you know, I'd say the risk of developing them when that's the abundant part of how we eat. And so I do tell people as they're looking and they're trying to figure out how to navigate this foodscape with intentionality, do your best and use a combination of fresh as well as shelf stable options and think about price. I definitely say budget out your food dollars. And I also understand, listen, Kavita, I have patients who work on 24 hour shifts. If you're working a 24 hour shift, I am definitely not going to tell you that you need to be standing at your kitchen in front of your stove for hours. What I'm going to say is what's the most nourishing thing that we can get into your body that takes you the least amount of time to prepare. So sometimes it is a, maybe I'll take your Arby's meal. What can we round it out with? <laughs> you know what I mean? What's that side going to be? And is there space for an apple? <laughs> so it's things like that. Um, I try to be realistic, meet folks where they are. So, you know, to expand on this conversation and dietary patterns, I think I know the perfect person to have this conversation with. So after the break, we'll bring in Professor Christopher Gardner. He's the Director of Nutrition Studies at the Stanford Prevention Research Center and a professor of medicine at Stanford University and the leader of that twin study that we mentioned earlier. For the past 20 years, most of his research has been focused on investigating the potential health benefits of various dietary components or food patterns using randomized controlled trials. Stay tuned. Well, now, listeners, if you're enjoying the show and want to hear more, subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Wednesday morning. While you're there, check out our other episodes, too, like last week's, where we find ways to beat the heat with former U.S. Surgeon General Richard Carmona. He currently lives in Arizona, one of the hottest states in the nation, 
and uses decades of experience as a first responder to give us top-notch tips on preventing heat-related illness. Check it out. Hey, it's Carvel Wallace, host of Slate's podcast, How To, and we just hit our five-year anniversary. That's over 250 episodes of life-changing advice on every topic imaginable. And so to celebrate, my co-host Courtney Martin and I recently talked with the show's founder, Charles Duhigg. We had, we had a guest on once, we were talking about talking to your kids about sex. And she said, you would never have one conversation with your kids about table manners right. and then assume that their table manners are going to be good for life, right? Instead, you have like a thousand conversations with your kids about table manners. Oh, shit. Charles, now I'm, I'm worried I haven't had enough table manners conversations. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely talked about sex a lot, but I don't know how much we've talked about table manners. Just as long as they don't have sex at the table, they're good to go. So far, so As good. long as they know how to spoon, <laughs> even if they don't know which spoon to use, it'll totally work out. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> oh man. On How To, we answer your toughest questions with grace, wisdom, and humor. Which is why, five years on, we're still going strong. Listen to How To, wherever you get your podcasts. Former President Donald Trump has rewritten the rules of how the American justice system treats our nation's most powerful people. But long before this year's historic Supreme Court term, or even his presidency, Trump developed an approach to the law that has shielded him from legal accountability on everything from taxes to fraud to discrimination. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. All through August, Amicus will dive deep into Trump's history of bending the law to his will in a series we're calling The Law According to Trump. Hosted by award-winning journalist Andrea Bernstein, the series will highlight the tactics that led to Trump's recurring legal battles and examine the legal blueprint he used to fight back to better understand how he'll continue to capitalize on his victories and fight to overturn his defeats, whether he does it from inside or outside the White House. Listen to The Law According to Trump on Amicus from Slate. Welcome back. You're listening to Well Now from Slate. I'm Kavita Patel. And I'm Maya Feller. So Kavita, you and I have talked a lot about how important it is to have a varied pattern of eating, especially one that is accessible and culturally relevant. So today we are thrilled to talk to one of the country's leading experts in researching the effects of diet on health, Professor Christopher Gardner at Stanford University. Christopher? Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So before we dive in, I want to ask you a question. We want to ask you this question. How do you define wellness? Oh, that's a great question to ask me because my division started a wellness living laboratory. We actually started this with several thousand people at Stanford and we're actually now in Taiwan and China and Singapore and a couple other places. And an interesting debate came up about wellness and well-being, right? And so there's, there's some very nuanced differences between those two. And, and well-being seemed to be more about physical activity and, and being vital and being able to reach things. And wellness, we have this uh, iconic flower with petals and there's one petal for each domain and one is you know um sociability and friends and connections and one is religion and one is financial and one is physical activity and one is diet and one is emotional and as they went from one country to the next the emphasis on the different components of wellness had different emphases Right. And so some some countries, there was much more emphasis on spirituality than others, uh, others on financial health than others. So sorry if that was a longer definition than you wanted. But for me, wellness has a dozen different domains of them. I focus on the lifestyle part and of lifestyle. I focus on nutrition. So I feel like my contribution is fantastic, but it's really only a minor piece of overall wellness. We love that. That's not a, a long answer because it's just such a nice, it underscores that wellness 
can be defined and especially individually so many ways. Let's build, Christopher, if you will, on that kind of talk about nutrition. Um, I think that one thing I was that I've been very proud, and I realize it's your work at Stanford University, has been something of your manifesto around food and its impact on health. And you've been doing work not only at Stanford to change the food that's available campus-wide, but also trying to take that across campuses in the United States and maybe globally. But tell us what you're doing in that regard around food and nutrition in the university setting. That was really fun. So this actually goes back a little more than a decade If you go back a decade, there's a group called Old Ways Preservation and Trust. And this is a group that sort of brought the Mediterranean diet to the U.S. It was a collaboration between Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Culinary Institute of America. And chefs from the Culinary Institute of America were getting very frustrated at being super reactive. So, oh, my God, today it's gluten-free, and then it's vegan, and then it's paleo, and then it's keto, and, oh, my God, i got to change my menu again, and I might even have to buy different uh, equipment in the restaurant to make those different dishes. So they said, okay, can we get a a science board together to see what isn't a fad thing in diet? What will never go away? What's evergreen? Let's get a business board to show that if you followed these principles, you would make money and customers would come back and you have to stay commercially, financially viable to, to maintain what you're doing. And a chef board, because the chefs are love what they're doing. They're creating great unapologetic deliciousness, which is a term hopefully I'll come back to in a minute. And I got to be on the science board that figured out what was never going to go away. And between us, we all came up with the 24 principles of the menus of change, which is something that's pretty easy to look up. And 12 of those were very nutritional. They were foods and nutrients and and very specific to ingredients and food items. And the other 12 were operational, like celebrate diversity and local when you can and more from a business perspective. And that got kicked off for a couple of years. And I was involved in the first couple of conferences. They they have an annual conference and we just came back from our 12th or 13th recently. And so here's a, an interesting political thing, which is Harvard is very close to the main campus of the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. But they have a major satellite campus in Napa and actually St. Helena. And so the Napa St. Helena folks hang out with Stanford and the Hyde Park folks hang out in, uh, with Harvard. So we had a couple of meetings on this end and it turns out that the, the, the provost here, the, uh, more than that, Shirley Everett, she has a really long title, but basically she's in charge of all buildings and all food residential and dining enterprises. And unbeknownst to me at that time, it turned out that at least two decades ago, she hired chefs for all the dining halls. And at the time, that was like a big deal. Why are you hiring chefs? Why don't you hire food service people to slop out food to the students? They're just trying to study and go to bed and wake up and study some more. And she said, no, 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 no. This this really should be a serious thing. This food, I'm going to hire CIA-trained chefs. And we thought about those 24 principles of the menus of change. And we actually had an ex officio partner, Google, come in, Michael Bacher, who actually just took on a role. (laughs) He just left Google and he will now be the president of the CIA. But we had Google, we had Stanford, we had the CIA, we had a bunch of us sitting around a table and said, um, what about the research aspect of this? What about using dining halls as living laboratories? What if some of these things that we're thinking about that are important from a food systems perspective could be tested with chefs and operators and students and researchers, faculty who would be interested in this kind of research? So uh, a little more than 10 years ago, the MCRC was born, the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. And so my currency is research papers. And I've now got a half dozen research papers that came from not only Stanford's dining hall, but the the uh, the evolution of this involved starting with Stanford, asking people to join. Uh, at one point, we had 20 universities, then 50, and now we're over 70 that are part of this collaborative. And so the best thing that we do here, if it's working really well, is one university will pilot some kind of intervention pilot it, 
uh, and then offer it up to the collective, saying, we did this thing on our campus, but if we publish this on our campus only, somebody might think, oh, it's only in Palo Alto. Oh, it's only in uh, at Harvard. Oh, it's only at Northwestern. So what if we offer it up and try to replicate it across multiple universities? And so we've now done a dozen or so of those studies where we do it one place, replicate it. It's science. There's faculty. There's chefs. There's students. And it is a blast. And the the three pillars of this, to be, this is an important point, lead with unapologetic deliciousness because we are working with chefs. Lead with taste. And then have human health and environmental health in the back pocket so that they're aligned. So it's incredibly delicious. We're supporting human health and we're doing it in a way that's kind to the planet. That has been just a game changer for me. That's been one of the most satisfying shifts in my whole career of 30 years. So I, I love the trifecta of taste, human health, and the consciousness around the earth that we all inhabit. I could imagine, Christopher, that this, I mean, now I'm like very excited thinking, ooh, this would be amazing if it exploded everywhere and this were just like the standard. So we know that your research, it spans so many various dietary patterns and their impact on health. And we know that you've done really interesting research around vegan and vegetarian patterns of eating. What are some of the most compelling findings that you would, you know, that come to mind for you from your work over the years? Like, what do you find compelling? At this point, I've, I've probably done more than two dozen randomized human nutrition intervention trials. And one of the most satisfying things I did, I'm, I'm currently chair of the American Heart Association's Nutrition Committee. And they, in 2021, they updated their guidelines and they didn't really change very much. I'm also on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Those get updated every five years. They don't change very much. A lot of stuff we know about proteins, carbs, fats, vitamins, and minerals just don't change. Uh, and the American Heart was getting a lot of questions about, okay, so I, I know you got all these things, eat veggies, eat fruits, eat whole grains, avoid sodas. How does that play into this idea of dietary patterns? So a big shift for me having been in this business for 30 years is a long time ago when we really weren't sure exactly which nutrients did what, and we were focused on isolationist, reductionist science. We did one nutrient at a time. And then people would kind of game the system and say, oh, here's this cookie. And they took a syringe and they inserted this cool thing in the cookie. So now it's a health food, right? They're still doing it, Christopher. (laughs) It's still a cookie. (laughs) So then we shifted to foods and we said, oh, let's study garlic and let's study soy and let's study. And I did that kind of thing for a while. But now there's really a lot of talk about paleo, keto, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, DASH, And so we got an interesting assignment from American Heart, which was now that we've upgraded and updated uh, the specific components of a heart-healthy diet, how do all those patterns out there match up to that? And so this is a really fun project. Part of it was defining the pattern. Um, Because I feel like a lot of people think Mediterranean is olive oil. So they'll have an Egg McMuffin for breakfast and a Big Mac for lunch and a Whopper for dinner. And they got a little jigger of olive oil by their nightstand. And they chug that before they go to bed. And they say, I'm Mediterranean, right? Or they are thinking about following a ketogenic diet and they know it's really low in carbs. And so they have a lot of meat. And actually, that's wrong. A ketogenic diet is super high in fat, not meat. So they said, get the patterns. And we had to we went, had to find a bunch of research papers to see how everybody was defining all those patterns. And they weren't all the same. If you can imagine, if, if you look into the details of these scientific papers, uh, some Mediterranean diets avoid dairy and some say, let's have yogurt. And um, right, so, so there are some subtle differences, but we had fun putting this together, like what the iconic Mediterranean, vegetarian, what keto, paleo, everything And we said, okay, and across all the domains, here's what matches up. And what came out of that I thought was really fun because they were very different diets, um, but there were four things that I keep finding again and again that are essential here. It was more vegetables 
and it was whole foods, and it was avoiding added sugars and avoiding refined grains, basically avoiding processed foods. And across every pattern, those were the same. Even though some of these diets are polar opposites, kumbaya moment, let's have a hug here. Like all these people are fighting about their favorite pattern on the internet or in social media, but those are quite consistent. And it might be super boring if those are things, well, well, we already do all those. Actually, those are four things that Americans really are terrible at. They don't eat a lot of vegetables. They don't eat a lot of whole foods. They eat, drink a whole bunch of soda, and they have a whole bunch of refined grains. And then there was an outer ring that if we just excluded a couple of those patterns, almost everyone agreed. So let me do those really quickly, which was beans, which have, oh my God, lectins in them. But okay, so just forget about it. The lectins are a rounding error. There's so many cool things in beans that um, avoiding them for lectins would be ridiculous. Fruits. Keto doesn't want you to have fruits. People on really low-carb diets don't want you to have fruits because of the sugars, but they're natural sugars. They're embedded in a food matrix that means their absorption is slower than added sugar. Nuts. Oh, my God, there's the low-fat vegan mafia that really doesn't like nuts because they're full of fat, but, oh, my God, it's unsaturated fat. So those are not bad at all. Ah, those are great sources of nutrients. And after that would be eggs and cholesterol, and I have fun in my... Stanford undergraduate nutrition class spending an hour on the cool metabolism of cholesterol that your liver adjusts for. And it turns out that blood cholesterol that adds to heart disease and plaques is more influenced by the saturated fat and the fiber in your diet than eggs. And okay, so eggs don't have any fiber, but they really don't have that much saturated fat. They do, they're a huge contributor to cholesterol. Boy, if I was thinking of having a sugary American breakfast cereal with orange juice, with jam, on my white bread versus eggs, I would pick the eggs. That first thing was carbs on carbs on carbs on carbs. Eggs are okay, and if the vegetarians could get over the fact that the fish have a face, fish are pretty universally accepted as being a really important source of nutrients across the world. So if you took, so I really feel like What hasn't gone away in 30 years is the set of the first four things that are accepted across all the patterns, even the most polar opposite patterns. And then there's sort of this next outer ring of almost complete agreement. So the vegans and vegetarians wouldn't want fish. And there's a couple of groups that wouldn't want some of the sugar or some of the fat or the beans. But, oh, my God, almost everybody agrees on that. And so this isn't so much my scientific studies. Sorry if, if I'm maybe avoiding the question, but the, you know, the social media discourse on how much controversy there is over nutrition. Oh my God. Why can't these nutrition scientists agree? So I'm on the dietary guidelines advisory committee. I'm chair of the American Heart Association. I helped the American Diabetes Association put together their guidelines in 2019. And I've served with this culinary industry of America group on. There are 24 principles of the menus of change. And every one of those groups that I worked with, the amount of consensus was enormous. And I, I leave every one of those and get on social media and see, oh my God, everything you thought you knew for 50 years is wrong. And so much contention coming out of that world and so many media headlines suggesting that there's this lack of consensus that some of us like, oh my God, this is so boring. Here we are again, reviewing the research five years later, 10 years later, it really hasn't changed. So for for me, that's been super powerful that the studies I do, the studies that others do, really are, are stunningly consistent. And so it drives me nuts that there seems to be so much controversy out there. And as a food fluencer, my, I'm sure you appreciate all that. I absolutely do, Christopher. I mean, I always say that when we tell folks to lean into consistency, they say that it's mundane and people want to be doing something extraordinary, which is why Mm. the fads always win out because it's like, here I am. There's Maya and Christopher and Kavita telling you to eat your vegetables, but X, Y, and Z person 
said, you know, go ahead and have this new souped up drink that's filled with, I don't know, some super nutrient. And everyone's like, oh, I'm going to have the souped up drink because that's where it's at. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to hear more from Christopher on the pursuit of health and wellness, one ingredient at a time. You're listening to Well Now from Slate. I'm Kavita Patel. And I'm Maya Feller. And we're continuing our conversation with Professor Christopher Gardner. So, Christopher, you introduce many people to your work, even though we know <laughs> that you have been engaged in research for decades. But for so many people, they actually found out about you from this recent Netflix series, You Are What You Eat, a twin experiment. Everybody knows the average American diet is not very healthy. We sometimes call it the standard American diet, or SAD for SAD. We're recruiting 21 pairs of identical twins with very different backgrounds for this study. We're gonna take advantage of new technology and new methodology that's gonna allow us to investigate metabolism in a very comprehensive way and show people the power we have at the end of our forks. And so what people saw was this really incredible cardiovascular benefit that came from a vegan diet in comparison to an omnivorous diet. And I, I know that folks were like, what, what does this mean for me? <laughs> like, what should I be doing? Should I change my entire life? Tell us what inspired you to do this study and the advantages of using identical twins in dietary research. Sure. So as I was mentioning before, a lot of my interests have shifted this sort of challenging idea of patterns as opposed to it's the garlic, it's the fiber, it's the soy, it's the whatever. And we were actually approached by the producer with this genetic identical twin idea. And my first reaction was, that does sound super cool from a scientific perspective. However, you know, recruitment is the hardest thing to do in a study. And the second hardest thing in a study is recruitment. And I thought, oh my God, you're going to handcuff me and have me do this in identical twins? It's already a pain in the butt getting... He said, no, no, no. I got twins ready for you. I found these twin registries. Uh, I will, I'll cover your butt. I've got these folks lined up. It didn't actually work as well as he thought. And we did have to go find more twins. But he very intentionally went and found four mediagenic twins that they would follow throughout. I got a lot of pushback of why didn't we follow every single twin um, throughout the thing, which would have been prohibitive. But here was this cool idea to do vegan versus omnivore. And he said, you know, I don't know how to do studies. So I don't know what the main outcome would be. I don't know what the duration would be. I don't know how you'd get them to eat the food, but that's the study that I think could be done and could be engaging. And ah, this is where my staff and I love to play in this space, right? So one of the things we decided was, well, let's look at the budget here. It's not infinite. So we're not gonna be able to do this forever. What's our main outcome? Well, it's not super thrilling, but let's do LDL cholesterol. That's an established clinical risk factor. The vegans should benefit from that. What if we do vegans versus a crappy other diet and there's a straw man to knock over? Let's not do that. I see that in some of the scientific literature. Let's make a really healthy omnivorous diet. Now, Louie, I got to tell you, if we make a really healthy omnivorous diet, it's not going to be all that much different from the vegan diet. So I can't promise you anything is going to change here. And it's really only enough money to do eight weeks. But I'll tell you what, we'll get these folks kicked off to be adherent right away with a food delivery service. So we negotiated for months with different um, food delivery services and and I said, let's serve your top omnivore meals to the omnivores. And how many vegan options do you have? Okay, yours look better than the other person's. So let's go with you. So for four weeks, we delivered food. They're kind of instantly adherent. And then for four weeks, they cooked on their own. And the omnivores who were omnivores to begin with, if you use a healthy eating index metric, they ate more healthfully 
as omnivores in the study than they had been doing before the study. And to me, this is hugely important. Like we're not trying to have a straw man comparison over here to knock down. And the vegans also ate really healthfully and their healthy eating index went up. And I really didn't know what would happen if they were both healthy. But I really feel like that that's essential in doing one of these studies, not to have a crappy comparison diet. So in just eight weeks, their LDL did drop, their fasting insulin dropped. They lost a little weight when they were vegans. We were looking at trimethylamine oxide, which is an emerging risk factor for heart disease. That one's a little more complicated. It did work better for the vegans, but only if you excluded some fish intake that was happening. I'm doing a little bit of hand waving that your audience won't be able to see there. We did some really cool studies that I didn't think would work. And I even told Louis, oh my God, don't waste your money. It's only eight weeks. We're going to look at telomeres, telomere length, and we're going to look at a group that has an epigenetic biological clock. They actually have three biological clocks that you can do with epigenetics to tell your biological age, not your chronological age, to see if that differs. The telomeres were better in the vegans in just eight weeks. The biological clocks were better in the vegan twins in eight weeks. And we have yet, and that paper is actually about to be published. The, The main initial findings were published in JAMA Network Open in November, a month before the Netflix thing was released. The telomere length The biological clocks is probably going to be out within a month or so. And there's some very cool microbiome results that I can't tell you about now. Um, There's a little bit of competition for these results, but the Sonnenberg lab actually wanted to delay this. So there was a benefit for the vegans and they wanted to go back to a mouse model to see if they could mechanistically understand how that happened in just eight weeks with a better explanation from the mouse model. So some of those results of the the microbiome wasn't presented uh, to any great deal in the Netflix because those really weren't available, but the telomeres and the biological clock and the others were. Christopher, just for people who might not have seen it or don't understand how profound that telomere finding is, can you just briefly explain what is a telomere? Why is a change in telomeres in just eight weeks something that, uh, honestly, I still, there's part of me that just can't believe it because it just seems just hard to believe. (laughs) But just explain, if you don't mind, for listeners what that that means. Yeah, it really does. And it's new to me, Kavita, so I haven't measured it before because from my reading of it, it doesn't change very fast. So our DNA, our chromosomes have caps on them and the caps sort of are protective of them. And as we age, what is seen is that naturally the cap length shortens and it's more, so some of that protection goes away and it sort of suggests that you're older. So, uh, A longer cap on the telomere suggests protecting you somewhat from aging. It's a hot new thing. I don't usually do it. I told him not to waste his money. And it was, we were kind of blown away when both of those things changed. And so I, I could never quantify and say in eight weeks, they got three days younger or three months younger or three. I don't have any idea like how much, but it was statistically significant. And so we're writing a research paper on it. It's really fascinating. So Christopher, as you're, you know, I've heard you talk about some of the blowback from the study where people were up in arms about various parts of it. And some of the criticisms were valid and some of them, I mean, were not. But in your estimation, what do you think were the most valid criticisms of the study, and how might future research address those issues? I'm going to start with the one that can't be addressed. Why didn't you do this for a couple of years? Why didn't you wait till they lived or died? We only know that risk factors changed. We don't know if you kept anybody out of the hospital. That can't be done in a randomized trial. Nobody's willing to say, oh yeah, I'd be willing to be vegan or not for a year or a decade or whatever. That's super hard to recruit for, but it's valid. We are interested in health outcomes, not just risk factors, but when we don't have the ability to track them for that long in a randomized trial, we use risk factors that you can measure every day. So valid criticism, I'll never be able to address that one. Uh, One that was annoying was at one point, the director wanted to measure everything under the sun and I had to say, okay, we really don't have enough money for one more thing. And he wanted to do 
body composition. And he wanted to do dual energy absorbed geometry, which shows you how much lean versus fat you have. And I said, we, we just don't have that. And he said, well, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little um, sarcastic here, but Louis said, I have this super buff vegan dude who can train them. And he can be in the movie. And so everybody will see this super buff vegan dude training them. He didn't actually say it to me that way. So I'm just being a little flippant here. And sure enough, Nima Delgado is pretty ripped. And he was in there showing him what to do. Only the eight twins that were part of the featured part of Netflix were in this. And they showed them talking to the business where they do this. I never saw the data. Only eight people did it. And at the end, it really looked like just from the eight people, the vegans lost some lean muscle compared to the omnivores. And they also lost visceral fat, which was a good thing. So losing lean muscle was bad. Losing visceral fat was good. It just sort of got left hanging that way. And people read our published paper and they said, oh, you unethical scum. You, you found a result that wasn't positive and you left it out of the study. Oh, my God, no one should ever believe you anymore. So it was very hard to respond at that point and say, you know, we actually never had those data. Only eight people did it. I pushed back at that point because we didn't have enough money. Sure, if we did that study again, we should do DEXA on everyone and have an average and a standard deviation and be able to do a statistical test. But the reason it was never in the paper, but you saw it in Netflix, is that they spent a lot of time filming those eight people and getting this really fantastic guy, Nima Delgado, to be in the film. And it really didn't look like it came out well, but that is not why it wasn't in the paper. You always know that there's so much kind of behind the story. There's thinking through like how you actually create something that's production worthy. I know that you had to do that times 10,000 probably for a Netflix special, but it is an amazing. I followed the Google word alerts, Christopher, kind of as the documentary was released, kind of when it was first there. It was amazing to see the Google searches for vegan just skyrocket. So I want to like wrap up and give you a chance to close. Let's say you're just coming to somebody, I'm sure lots of people at conferences and even just someone who might recognize you stops you on campus all are looking to kind of benefit from the knowledge you've gained, as well as benefit from kind of what they might have watched either on the documentary or read some of the papers. What is a what, what are some practical kind of diet advice, like nutrition like tips that you would give someone looking to improve their health? I think that we're all trying to elevate the role of food in, in wellness. And what more do you, I know you're working on things, so we'd love to hear what more you're working on. So practical advice, and then what's on the horizon for Christopher and and his rabble rousers? Yeah, so the first part was the point of the study and the Netflix. I think this is practical. We weren't trying to get everybody to go vegan. It's like, oh, you did that movie, so you turn the world vegan. That's not going to happen anytime. I'm not that narcissistic or, or delusional to think that. We only had eight weeks and so it was like, oh, if you really want to see something happen that has scientific validity and, and you can see numbers change, you sometimes have to do something a little extreme. And that was sort of the fun part of it was vegan was extreme. Another fun part from a practical point of view, and I actually thought Louis did a great job of capturing this, was did you see how many twins didn't really want to be vegan? They said they'd be in the study, but they were pretty resistant to it. And I can say we didn't, we're not officially following them, but Many of them are not vegan, but more plant-based. They're eating more plants. So the practical advice here is just look at what you're eating. And it doesn't take that long to think about it. And is there room for more plants and less animal products? And my career has also shifted beyond health to the environment. And when you look at how that lines up, lines up really well. If we had fewer animal products, if we grew fewer crops for livestock feed and fed people those foods directly we'd be better off for human health and the health of the planet. So the, the practical advice is don't get all upset if you can't be all or nothing here. It was never really about that. It was just to take a look and say, wow, think about taking advantage of cultures like Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, Asian. There's many of the cultures in the world were much more predominantly plant-based than the U.S. diet right now. 
there is just a huge room for improvement. And people can make a shift in that direction without changing their whole life. Just try making some shifts. And quite a few of the twins, again, are either vegetarian now or know a lot of vegan options that they like. They're not vegan. They're not totally vegetarian. They made some shifts. That was the main point. The practical point here is to make a shift toward that direction. Professor Christopher Gardner, researcher, dietary innovator, and disruptor, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and giving me a chance to share some of this today. That's our show this week. Well Now is produced by Vic Whitley Berry. Ben Richmond is Slate Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio. We'd love to hear from you. Email us at wellnow@slate.com. If you want to support this show, please consider becoming a Slate Plus member. Just $5 a month helps Slate continue to make shows like ours, as well as all of the other podcasts you love, like Slow Burn, ICYMI, Political Gab Fest, and more. Learn more at slate.com slash wellnow plus. And join us back here next Wednesday for another wellness story we can't stop thinking about. I'm Maya Feller. And I'm Kavita Patel. Thanks for listening.